Hello everyone and welcome to my 2021 uh, GCAP talk, How Not to Tank Your Career in 280 Characters or Less, or otherwise known as Get Yelled At by Zia on How to Use Social Media for 40 Minutes. Um, I'm going to have to record this one take all the way through with some hiccups here and there, otherwise this is never going to get recorded because this is probably my fifth or sixth attempt at doing this. So uh, let's just go straight into it. Before we begin, um, I want to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to, to the, the traditional owners of the lands upon which we are gathered today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future and emerging and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who might be here today. Pay my respects to your elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded. All right. The hardest part about this talk for me was kind of figuring out where to begin, um, mostly because I don't know where you're at. So for some of you, there's going to be a little bit of, I already know this and this is obvious, but I wanted to cover all of my bases um, and make sure that, um, you know, everyone came away with this from the same level of knowledge. And perhaps a good place to start is answering the question of who the hell am I and why do I think I have the authority to talk about this? Um, hi, I have an undergraduate degree in written communication. Um, I did a master's in um, game design as well in about media and communication and my field of expertise is kind of communication in and of itself. And video games are a field and medium of, of communication regardless of how you want to kind of address that. So um, my expertise professionally in games is very much motivated by an understanding of the written word. Um, which, unfortunately, when I see a lot of social media usage from some game developers or some students of game development, kind of leaves me looking a little bit like this. So, um, today's talk is very much motivated about, you don't have access to the training that I do all three years to learn it, so here's the quick and dirty of, of what some of the stuff is. Um, ultimately, so you stop doing that. This is gonna be a talk of two parts, but the parts are very closely related. The first part is your professional part, and the second part is um, your personal. Sorry, I had those first. First part is, well, the first part is professional, the second part is personal, but they are the kind of the same, the coin two sides adage, um, and that coin, you know, being social media. That would be an example of where I would go back and record this again, but we are not going to do that. Um, so, really quickly, I want to cover why written communication is a professional skill. And by professional, I mean trained. Um, elements of clarity, legality, ethicality, and social culturality that I won't go into because it'll be incredibly boring for those of you who aren't looking for a professional career. And for those of you who are, who are looking for um, more understanding of media communications, I would recommend um, some kind of cover writing experience or even a degree if necessary because there are some core things in there that cannot be covered in a 40 minute talk. But for those of you who you know probably aren't trained and don't see why we need training, there's plenty of things out there that can teach you, you know, how do I write a cover letter? How do I write, you know, the the business apology? How do I write a PR release? And anyone who's watching this who has expertise in that field knows that there is a difference between knowing how to apply these skills and following a template you can only go so far with the template and if anything that you do isn't covered by that template you won't even know that it should be there um so this talk is not again in place of professional education it is just a skimming off the top kind of hopefully you'll come away with this with something so um one of the big issues with written communication is the fact that there are some serious legal implications from it as well. Um, even if you don't know about it, it doesn't matter, they're there. Uh, some people will have heard things about um, uh, apology letters for that, that they're not actually apologizing for. There's a reason for that. The reason for that being that 
if someone says I'm sorry, they're actually opening themselves up to being sued. So one of the skills that I learned was how to write one of those awful letters where we're apologizing literally for someone dying on the site, but not opening ourselves up for litigation. Example being, we, a totally responsible company, are devastated to learn that a tragedy has occurred at our work site. We endeavoured to maintain a safe working environment for all staff, and to know that our procedures may have been ignored is unacceptable to us. We are in contact with the family and those involved to uncover what has led to this event in an effort to ensure it never happens again. At no point are you going to say, I'm sorry, that opens you up for being sued, especially for a workplace malpractice. But you do have your emotional response we have a heartfelt apology or what looks like an apology. You have the, we've done everything that we are legally required to do, therefore you can't sue us. We are doing things within our power, but the fact that this has happened is clearly someone else's fault and this person has been, we rest assured, fired. And if it does occur again, well, we've put enough words in place that it's not our fault if it does happen again. If you've read these kind of letters, you know I'm not being facetious. These actually exist and they exist for a legal reason. Another example of why the, the written word has a lot of power is something called the Oxford comma. Um, a lot of you should have heard about it. There are numerous memes about it. Some of you might have heard it as being the Harvard comma. I don't care. We're going to ignore that. It's the Oxford comma. The Oxford comma is a comma used in place of listing. And now, why this is really important is because in high school, a bunch of you were probably taught you do not put a comma after and. This comma comes after and. So, oh sorry, before and. This comma comes before and. So, this idea of you were taught one way in high school and it being directly contravened by tertiary education is pretty much one of those examples about why tertiary education is sometimes super important for these very specific skill sets. Here are some examples of some of the most humorous Oxford commas that are out there that are not, you know, inflammatory. Among those interviewed were Merle Haggard's two ex-wives, Chris Christopherson and Robert Duval. The Oxford comma should have gone after Christopherson, which would have listed four people, two ex-wives, Chris Christopherson and Robert Duval. Instead, Merle Haggard's two ex-wives are named Chris Christopherson and Robert Duval. This book is dedicated to my parents, Anne Rand and God, and that would have been an incredibly interesting child to meet. Highlights of Peter Ustinov's global tour include the encounters with Nelson Mandela, apparently who is an 800-year-old demigod and a dildo collector, instead of three people that were met. Um, these are examples that are humorous where the Oxford comma should have been in place. There are legal reasons why an Oxford comma should be in place. For example, in the early 2010s, there was a lawsuit in the state of Maine, the state of Maine, this is not a company sort of thing, this is the state of Maine, that says that there are exemptions of overtime for, in this example, the canning, processing, preserving, freezing, drying, marketing, storing, packaging for shipment or distribution of agricultural produce, meat and fish products, and perishable foods. Now, without the Oxford comma, which should have gone after the packaging of shipment um, in this era, these things here are all kind of encased in that overtime oversight, I guess. And whilst this is funny in the earlier examples, for this instance, it resulted in a $13 million lawsuit, which was settled, but $13 million nonetheless. A funny instance where grandma being incorrect had a numerical value attached to it. So these are the legal consequences in terms of being sued, well, for contracts. A couple of others that you've probably heard of, and we will talk about them a little bit more later, are the words slander, libel, and defamation. So these kinds of things are super easy to look up. I'm not gonna go into them too far, but people still don't quite understand what they are. And it's one of those things where whether or not something is slander, libel, and defamation is the, is the pursuit of people who are far more qualified in the courts of law. What education in uh, communication is about is knowing how to have a long, hard think about what you're about to publish and whether or not it's about to fuck your life up. And there is my one use of the F word. Now I'm probably going to use it again. 
So when you see things in journalism and written publication that say things like accused or allegedly or charged with, the reason these words are used is legal. It is because you cannot say someone is a murderer until they are found guilty in a court of law. And in that case, you don't say they are a murderer. You say they have been found guilty or they have been charged. Because in the cosmic right and wrong of the written word, if they are absolved, there can be litigious pursuits for damages that are done as a result of that. So words like accused, allegedly and charged with are safe in written publication. Even though it's pretty obvious they might have done it, it doesn't matter. This is one of those instances where you need to make sure that you're just not sued. Simple as that. Even though there are some instances where these headlines in Playing Safe are playing into these fallacies of misogyny and oppression and things like that. We're not going to go into that because we'll be here forever. But if you do want to do it, Jane Gilmore has an excellent book called Fixed It, which is about the headlines specifically around the representation and of violence towards women in the media. So please check that out if you want to see some pervasive ways in which this kind of heteronormative standard is reinforced through the headlines. So the standard of legal representation in written communication and the standard of contracts, things like that, is pretty obviously resolved with hire a professional. It should be obvious. In fact, it should be so obvious that the more important a document is, the more qualified the person writing it should be. And this should be a really core instance of duh, but as we saw with the main protocol, sometimes things slip through, but also sometimes people just don't do that. And it's not just a matter of legal documents. Clarity of communication can be a real sticking point if you don't have someone who knows how things might be misinterpreted. However, it is really important to move through this professional element because it is kind of relevant to your everyday use of social media. The idea of copy editing, the idea of proofreading, the idea of copywriting suddenly becomes very different when we realize that the access we all have to publishing the written word. Everything you put out there, written or spoken, is accessible. Even the secure stuff. Um, it's just a matter of what key does a person have in order to fix fit the safe lock that you've put around it. Even companies like Google, which it is in their best interest to not get hacked, don't always have the most secure standard. So if you are relying on Google, for example, to keep your work secure, it is only as secure as Google itself is. Everything is accessible. Hell, the fact that you access it means it is accessible. So therefore, it might be accessible to people you don't want to see it. And unfortunately, you don't all have a personal trainer standing over your shoulder telling you what not to put in writing on the internet. So unfortunately, you're the one who has to do a big hard think about how your words might fuck your life. So let's go into some real quick tips and tricks so you can kind of understand how that's going to work. The first thing you need to know is that you are your own public relations and this is not something you can avoid if you are putting any words out there on the internet and if how easy those words are to trace back to you is what the public relations that you have, your, your showing of yourself through the internet. In fact, it's so pervasive that it doesn't matter what you're using, someone's using it and someone's using it for various reasons. The fact that in 2021, we can have a headline that says 101 social networking sites need to know about implies that there are more than 101. So it's inescapable. It's just whether or not you're using them for the right reasons and other people are using them for the right reasons. The downside to that is you're out there with zero expertise and zero training and zero understanding of, of the implications necessarily. You are, of course, going to increase your, your understanding, which is why you're in this GCAP talk, of course. But I do want to stress that your professional training for most people who can be and is zero. So here is some movement through that. 
Oh, I left a transition in. The first thing I want to address is the idea that you are entitled to your opinion. Now, this is something that a lot of people know, but misinterpret in that understanding. Entitlement as a definition means that you have some kind of special treatment as a result of this entitlement. You are, you know, treated specially to your opinion. Now, everyone has opinions, and this is true because opinions exist in your brain. Everyone has thoughts, and you can't be charged for your opinions because that's a thought crime, and that is a very Orwellian place we do not want to go, right? Yes, you are entitled to your opinion because your opinion lives in your brain, and people can't reach into your brain and take opinions out, right? No one can change how you think except yourself. What it doesn't mean is anything outside of the brain. This is an action. If you take your opinion and you put it on the internet, that is not an entitlement to an opinion. That is now an action. And I really, really need to emphasize this. The action is not the same as having an opinion. It is doing a thing, right? So if you decide this thing I have in my brain is so important, I have to share it with the world, you are now migrating from an opinion entitlement to an action to disseminate that opinion. The nuance about how this works is, you know, something for the court of law, because this is kind of the only place where that infamous phrase, freedom of speech, is going to start coming up, right? Does something infringe upon freedom of speech is hard to define definitively within a court of law if you don't have those qualifications because there are associations that can be drawn, there are, you know, there are um, implications, there are threats, there are all these kinds of things that cannot be discussed in a, you know, 40 minute GCAP talk. So we're going to leave that for the court of law. What I am going to do is break down some of the things of freedom of speech, which I know some people are probably already thinking about in terms of action and disseminating information, because a lot of people get it wrong. And this is, this is such a bugbear with me. Their freedom of speech is not a get out of jail free card for anyone to say what they want on the internet. Freedom of speech covers the creation of laws that infringe on a civilian's right to say stuff. And that's it. It involves the government. Freedom of speech involves the government governing through laws what people can say, right? Now, this does not mean that the government cannot tell you what you can't say at any point. I've just realized that that government image is behind the webcam, sorry. But that's a picture of the government. Government you know, has certain views and values and again, court of law stuff. The government is able to decide what you can and can't say, what you can and can't be told off for. So freedom of speech is there to make sure that essentially people are not punished or black bagged for saying that the government kind of sucks and is doing bad things. Your ability to rail against the prime minister, your ability to, you know, shout out to the rich, your ability to um, say that the way people are being treated is bad is, is that's what freedom of speech is for. It's essentially saying, you know, um, you can't say the president is bad because we'll come into your house and take you away sort of thing. But, you know, it's, it's a guideline. It's not a rule. It's a human right. It's not a human automatically existent. Like I said, that's it. It does not cover or does not prevent you from being sued. It doesn't prevent you from being fired or banned or removed. And it doesn't stop you from being deplatformed from private entity. In fact, and this is something a lot of people get wrong, a private entity's ability to ban you, remove you, fire you, deplatform you are actually exercises of freedom of speech. A private entity, which is not the government, a private entity saying this thing that this person has said whilst under our employee is something we do not agree with and therefore we are going to dissolve this relationship we have with them in order to dissociate ourselves with what they are saying. That is actually freedom of speech. 
To compel someone to associate with words they do not want to say is, in terms of freedom of speech, the same thing as compelling someone to not say something they want to say. So, if Twitter bans you, Twitter is entirely allowed to do that. The other thing I want to talk about really quickly is the fact that freedom of speech has limits. Something that a lot of people don't know about or don't care about, there are actually freedom of speech limits. It is in the freedom of speech human right, you can go read that. I'll let you do all your research on your own, but there are limits to freedom of speech. Hate speech is not protected by freedom of speech. Anything that incites to illegal action is not protected by freedom of speech. Harmful conduct is not protected by freedom of speech. And my camera is covering that a little bit, but it says, stuff that's counterproductive to a functioning society is not protected by freedom of speech. Now, hate speech is, again, one of those things where the courts of law are going to have to decide that. You know, um, illegal action, harmful conduct, they, you know, incite, they're, they're the ones that decide that. Um, but stop using it wrong, please. Honestly, stop using it wrong. Freedom of speech doesn't let you say terrible things and get away with it. Freedom of speech doesn't let you just put your opinion out there and get away with it. Hate speech is usually something that is legally defined as something that exists only to incite violence towards somebody, right? It's the only reason for it to exist. There is no misinterpretation. Hate speech is designed to drive violence, discrimination, hatred, and I don't mean just physical violence, all kinds of violence, towards anyone. That's what's defined as hate speech. But again, courts of law sort of thing. Anything that cites to illegal action, what is illegal action as defined by the government, right? Harmful conduct, what is harmful as defined by the government? And stuff that's counterproductive to a functioning society. And I'm going to say it and I genuinely don't care. If you are a person who is saying wrongful things and encouraging people to not do things that are productive to society, for example, getting vaccinated, these things are not covered by freedom of speech. Being cautious and dubious, those things are. But telling people to not get vaccinated for blatantly incorrect things, these are not covered by freedom of speech. So freedom of speech has essentially been bastardized. Now, of course, there are debates that can happen on that and whether or not something is or isn't freedom of speech can be, you know, disgust of, oh, if you fire this person using the threat of unemployment to ensure that they cannot get a, you know, feed themselves, is that an infringement of freedom of speech? That's not for me to decide. Today, we're just talking about how it applies to you, the individual who, you know, may or may not do something that they're allowed to do. It then gets taken into the court of law or a lawsuit emerges from it when you have done something to another person. Right? So if you say something and you say, oh, no, 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 I, I hate, you know, Amy Forben Lorber person. Sorry, Amy, I know you're watching this. You, that was, it's an A. Um, who, you know, I had a terrible time with them and they, you know, they were an awful person. This person then says, hey, you used words in ways that I disagree with and I am now bringing a lawsuit against you to say that I don't like those words. You can't sue someone for not liking the words, but you can sue someone for doing wrong by you, doing a thing that in some way has caused harm. That's where these words start popping up. Slander, discrimination, harassment, libel, defamation, rebel assault. These are things, right? It is not the words that you're being sued for. It is the action. It is the intent behind them is that's getting you sued. Defamation, which was, you know, in that earlier slide, Defamation is a very specific thing that is very non-specifically argued. So defamation, if you want to look it up, involves a very specific word, which is harm, which should be highlighted, but they're out of order, who cares? Um, defamation, if you want to look it up, is very specifically harm. There are two forms of defamation, slander and libel. Both slander Slander is defamation, libel is defamation, slander and libel are not the same thing. So, slander involves intangible, spoken, the, um, the intangible and the spoken. So, like, he said, she said, reputation-y kind of stuff, right? Libel is specifically written. It's physical. It's published. It's out there. 
the idea of them being defamation comes to this word harm. This harm has to be provable. It has to be a financial amount that is um, attributed to what has been done. It is also required to be false, right? This is the core thing about what is defamation, libel, and slander. It has to have done harm and it has to have been false. Now, you can probably see why this is a litigious nightmare and defamation laws depend on where they are and who is bringing them to who and essentially who can pay for the better lawyer. But there are some core requirements. This does not mean that if it's true, you should say it. Because even though we are not in the courts of law, there is a very important court, the court of society, public court, the court of public opinion. Um, good luck with that. Because you're out there in this world where, you know, uh, social media is accessible and therefore everyone has, you know, their ability to publish themselves, but everyone else has their opinions on it. And believe me, they will have their opinions on it. And it doesn't matter what those opinions are, they, they're just going to have them. Um, anyone who's had a viral tweet that is any way controversial will know that there is someone out there who's going to ignore everything you've said and just draw their own conclusion. They're just going to do it. An example of this, a very famous example of this, is John Lennon's statement in 1966 where he said, we are more popular than Jesus now. This is a direct quote. He said, we are more popular than Jesus now. As you can see from the blacked out section, there is a larger context to this quote. But this part, we are more popular than Jesus now, is the one that everyone knows. And, you know, that was fine when it was published in Britain, UK, and I was like, okay, cool, we're more popular than Jesus now. But once it hopped over the pond to America, there was a slightly different response to it, um, which, you know, you probably are predicting. So this inflammatory comment suddenly blew up and John Lennon had to issue an apology, largely because there were threats to the safety of his bandmates, which, again, unsurprising. So he released this statement. I suppose if I had said television was more popular than Jesus, I would have gotten away with it. I'm sorry I opened my mouth. I'm not anti-God, anti-Christ, or anti-religion. I was not knocking it. I was not saying we are greater or better. The reason he's saying that they're more popular than Jesus is of televisions. And suddenly everything became reasonable because, of course, televisions are more popular than Jesus because they're in more people's homes than Bibles were at that age. And more people knew what a television was than, you know, people who followed the Christian faith. And so people would, okay, yeah, I get that. I get that. But if we go back to the original quote and we remove these blacked out bars, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that. I'm right. And I'll be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. That apology doesn't really satisfy this quote. Problem is, no one cared about the larger context. They only cared about this section, which is what the apology was for. TVs are more popular than Jesus. And it was fine. That's all they cared about. Another example, a much probably less famous but more infamous example, and again, I'm going to apologize to this person whose tweet I'm about to dredge up, and the only reason I'm totally okay with it is because it's everywhere. Some of you may know this name. Some of you may not know this name. All of you are going to know this tweet. She decided to tweet out, Going to Africa! Hope I don't get AIDS! Just kidding! I'm white. Apologies for the rampant racism of that but it was a famous example of someone not realizing what was about to happen. Justine then decided to jump on a plane and fly to Africa and turn her phone on airplane mode. And by the time she got off, this opinion, which she had decided to put out as an action, had instigated another raging mob. And not only that, in the duration it had taken for her to get on the plane and get off it, she was also fired from her workplace. This might be something where some people argue, was it right or was it wrong? 
but for the context of this talk, it really doesn't matter because she took this thought, put it into a tweet, and then it happened. And that's all that really matters. This woman has now faded into anonymity again and probably got a job again. And I'm sorry that I've had to drag this back up on um, this GCAP talk and please leave this poor woman alone for her terribly thought out tweet. But it happened. We saw the same with James Gunn when 10 year old posts got dredged up by extremists. They got him fired from Disney and then rehired again. If it's happened very recently where people have been confronted with 10 year old posts that get them fired from positions. Am I saying that we, you know, is that right? I, I don't think it's right. People grow in 10 years. It's an important thing to allow people to progress in order to be progressive. But it still happens, unfortunately. And before we get into it, I really don't want to talk about cancel culture. That is a whole other discussion to have about what's happening with cancel culture, the history of it, the fact that it's been wildly appropriated by, you know, usually rich white people to say that they're being cancelled because they said something that they shouldn't have said. You know, I don't, I, I don't want to talk about it. The memes are there. You can you can go with it. Although I do want to mention that, you know, people will talk about why a certain author is cancelled, but not why John Boyega hasn't had any roles in anything since he came out to talk about Black Lives Matter. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the fact that your social media is the job interview you don't know you're having. And I know that there are going to be people who are watching this who hire people. And there are going to be people who are watching this who want to be hired by those people. And I can tell you right now that the first thing that people are going to do is Google you. You are Googleable. You are out there. In fact, if you aren't out there, that is also something that they're going to notice. Why don't you have a social media presence? What are you not talking about? What are you not saying? Why aren't you saying it? You know, everyone has a Facebook. I don't have a Facebook, but if you don't have a Facebook, why? Because I'm paranoid about Facebook. If you have a, don't have a Facebook, do you have a LinkedIn? Do you have a Twitter? You have some kind of social media footprint out there that has you and your opinions and your thoughts and your values. It's whether or not it's easily accessible and to whom might want to access it. And if you're going to be associating with a company or a brand or a name, if people are going to look at you and look at them by its byproduct, they are going to scrutinize your social media footprint because they should, they need to. Because once you are associated with this company, everything you say that they allow you to say while in their employ, they will also be associated with. And this is something that you all have to think about. You know, to the extent that Google has support on how to manage your online reputation is how ubiquitous it has become. I'm starting to lose light, so I apologize if the glare starts changing. Overcast, Melvin. So in order to help you with that, I've put together a couple of checklists. Here's the first one. Are things for you to consider when you're putting anything out there? Who do you represent? Who will look at it? Who will want to look at it? Why will they look at it? What are the implications? This is really crucial. Not just what are you intending? What are the implications of what you've said? And please remember, even though tweets are now 280 characters, or le uh, characters long, that's still not a lot to get nuance or discussions. If you have to spread your tweet out into 10 different tweets, People are not going to read until the end. They are going to read the first tweet, maybe the first three tweets, and then stop. So if your nuance can't get across in your first tweet, people are going to misinterpret it or, you know, deliberately misrepresent what you're saying. How do you make sure you are really clear about your intent? Word choice matters. And are you really the one that should be saying it? And if it is, or is it, you know, if it's important to be said, does it have to be said? And does it have to be said by you? So really importantly, think about now and the future. If you want a job in game dev, what game development companies do you want to be a part of? What games narrative roles? What game animation roles? What industry roles do you one day want to have? And who is going to give a crap in 10 or 15 years about what you're saying now? Really think about whether or not you are the one that should be saying what is about to be said by you. 
does it really need to be said, right? Really importantly, if you're responding to a tweet that has this kind of a response level, no one is seeing your reply except for the people who are looking at you, right? No one is seeing your reply when they've tweeted that. They don't see what you've said. The people who see what you've said are the people who are looking at your profile, the people who are following you, the people who have invested interest in you. So be aware of that. And is it important that it is said at all, let alone by you? The onus, and this is such a big thing that a lot of people forget or don't know. The onus of the clarity of communication is on the communicator, not the recipient. If your recipient has misinterpreted your communication, you have failed. This is one of the core lessons in written communication. You are responsible for the clarity of your communication. But what if it is worth it? What if it's worth it being said? What if it's worth what needed to be put out there? Is, your important, is it important for you to voice your support or condemnation? Do you have some kind of expertise or advice? Is there something positive that you can provide? If that's the case, I could teach you my ways. Because I, I clearly didn't give a fuck about this kind of stuff, right? I put myself out there. I have angry rants. I get upset. I have opinions. And my workplace knows I have these opinions. My boss follows me, right? My workplace knows. They know I'm a feminist. They know how I feel on trans rights and black lives matter and abortion and global warning and anti-vaxxers and billionaires and capitalism. They all know. I've gone on anti-capitalist rants at work in front of my boss, okay? I have a good relationship with them where I went in and I said, hey, this is what I'm like. Can you please let me know what I shouldn't do? And they gave me a quick list of things I shouldn't do, you know, which were pretty obvious. Don't be racist. Don't be transphobic. Don't swear at the... Minister of Education, um, but you know, I still, I still say things that I probably shouldn't say. But you know, they will talk to me before they fire me, as long as it's not awful. If you've hit your "I'm going to do it," here's your "I'm going to do it" checklist: avoid your absolutes, your targeted critique, discussing minorities you aren't a part of, enlighten information or hot takes, and use wisely the words "I think" and "belief." Generalize commentary. No blame. Growth. Right. Don't say so and so is shit. I hate them and I'm never going to work with them again. Say I had I in my experience I didn't really enjoy working with blank. I'm going to try and do something different and see if it helps me. No blame. Just saying you didn't enjoy it. Moving on. Might have been you. Might have been them. What's the breakup? Who knows? Moving forward. Try not to name names. Naming names is not the greatest thing. Um, but sometimes that needs to happen. I am not going to talk about that realm. That is for you to talk about. I'm just talking about general social media use. Don't say it's just your opinion. We know. That's the point of using social media. You're putting your opinion out there. Don't, don't say that. Your word choice in that opinion is what is important. Make sure you try and think about the words that I used earlier. Accused, allegedly charged with vagaries. If you, someone, if you want to say something, use vagaries. Don't directly say this person is shite unless you want to, you know, unleash the wrath of their fan base upon you. An example of, you know, some word choices being important. Don't say, I heard company is a place of rampant inequality. I am not surprised. D don't say that. Don't say that because you'll never work there. It's, it's, you'll never work there. Their PR person, their recruitment person is going to find that and you will never work there. And this might include when they're better. So there are ways that you can voice your support, but also, you know, not tank your ability to work or get money or work in a place where there is rampant inequality. This is an absolute. This is an accusation. Don't do those. Instead, try. It's very sad to hear the accusations that are being leveled at company. I would be very disappointed to find out if they were true, right? I'm not talking about any recent stuff in particular. I'm just talking very vaguely. It happens a lot. But it's important for you to remain impartial. One, because it helps you get employed. Two, it means that once stuff comes, starts getting confirmed and those, you know, 
law cases start using words like convicted, you can then say, wow, that sucks and I am disappointed to hear it. It's supportive, but it's not absolute. Another example, name is a terrible person to work with. Don't do it if you value your health. This is an accusation and this is an absolute. You can be sued for this. The reason if we think back to the previous slide about defamation, it has to be false and it has to be hurtful. How do we prove this is false? How do we prove this is hurtful? It kind of falls to who has the better lawyer. Instead, try, some people have asked me about my experience working with name, and unfortunately it has been negative, and that is all I can say on the matter. That's not an absolute, and it's a personal opinion, right? It's a personal feeling. Can someone argue that your experience was negative? No. I mean, they could try, and if they're a really good lawyer, probably, but not really. If you say my experience was negative, you could say it was negative because they refused to pay for lunch. And someone else could turn around and say no one is supposed to pay for your lunch. Doesn't change the fact that it was negative, right? Don't say minority would do well to and then lecture them. Instead, shut up. I'm serious. There's a lot of opinions that are being shared out there that don't need to be shared. Do not say a rant about the industry is hiring only women is with a catalogue of busty, weirdly proportioned female presenting images as a portfolio. Instead, don't do that. Really think about what you're putting out there. This is another example of don't yell at people for shadows in games and then tell people that they're armchair developers when they're a part of AAA Studios. I have so many examples of this. I have seen it happen. It hurts me. Stop it. If you are young, experienced learning, not an expert, not a minority, privileged or older, do not speak with age if you're young. Speak with experience if you're inexperienced. Do not speak with tutelage if you are learning. Do not speak with expertise if you are not an expert. Do not speak in a place of minorities if you are not a minority. And if you are privileged, do not speak over the oppressed. If you are older, do not ignore the young. Essentially, if this doesn't directly apply to you, and you are not contributing anything constructive, shut up. It's more than just be nice. You have to be wise. If you don't think that your internet edgelord Reddit posts from your history under XXX game dev wannabe XX101 won't find you, you're going to say things that you shouldn't say. Don't say them, okay? Don't say them. There's a saying. Give a man a mask and he will show you his true face. Your true face should be the face that you show your bosses. Please, for your sake. And for those of you that have completely zoned out and aren't really focusing anymore and don't want to be here anymore, here are my too long didn't read rules. Never tweet in anger. I'm a hypocrite, I don't care. Never tweet in anger. Act, do not react. Take the time to think about what you're about to do. Don't just do it as a knee-jerk reaction. If you don't know the difference between acting and reacting, that is a whole other thing that I can't help you with. If you could, if you could not show your boss, if you don't want to show your boss, if you're afraid of your boss saying this, don't do it, right? Even if it's something that you 100% believe in, if you think it could get you fired, don't do it, right? We live in capitalism. We have to pay for food and housing and provide for our children. Do not compromise your ability to work for that if you don't have any other stable financial support. And if you feel like you have to hide your identity, don't do it. Safety considerations aside, of course. And as a final note, this is something that I ask myself every time I'm about to tweet. Every single time, especially if it's inflammatory. I always ask myself, if this tweet gets me fired now, or in 10 years, or in 20 years, am I okay with that? And I'm, and I'm, seriously, am I okay with that? And if the answer is no, I do not hit tweet. Thank you so much for attending my GCAP talk. Do not tank your character, your career in 280 characters or less. I was hopefully in the chat the whole time talking to you. If you have any questions, my at is at the start of the slides. You are more than welcome to jump back in. Otherwise, Thank you so much for being here um, and I hope you learned something today.